Hello and welcome to a digital lecture for Calculus 2 at Salt Lake Community College. In this video we're going to go through section 7.1, Integration by Parts. Now before we go into Integration by Parts, what I want to review real quick are the different integration methods we have at the moment. So what I have here are a collection of very common integrals that we tend to see and have covered up to this point. For example, number one and two are dealing with your standard dealing with a constant or dealing with an algebraic function, something u to the power of n, or just dealing with a constant uh, variable by, or a constant number by itself, like the integral of two, for example. Uh, so these are very common integrals that you tend to see, and a lot of them you are still going to have to remember. So I wanted to put them here as a reminder. You can always go back to these. Know, though, that there are other forms that are available in the back of the book in the integral section. And also, I have all of the trig functions here, but at the bottom I only have the two hyperbolic uh, trig functions for cinch and cosh. Um, however, you are still going to need to know the ones for a seek, for tanch, stuff like that. And you're going, you should know how to recognize the inverse uh, hyperbolic functions and the inverse trigonometric functions as well, because we are going to be looking for those. Um, other two that I have of note here, I have a number 13 and 14, uh, two other very common trig functions or you see or what ends up being inverse trig functions. And I'm just noticing that there is a typo on mine. I'll, I'll make sure to have it fixed when you have it out. Um, this one on 13 should be arc sine, not arc tan, of u over a plus c. And there's also one for 1 over a arc tan of u over a plus c. Now, these you do tend to see relatively often. However, moving forward, I do specifically want to highlight number 14 here because you're going to be surprised how often number 14 comes into play and how often we tend to see this form that turns into arctan or if you know it better as tan to the negative one, tan inverse. Um, these are very, very common ones. You may not have seen too much in Calc 1, but trust me, you will start to see them a lot in Calc 2. So I want to specifically highlight them so you start to look out for them. Uh, anything over an addition of squared values, that's going to be a very common form of arc tangent. So look out for that. Um, okay, so up to this point, you really only have one method of integration, and that method of integration that you've uh, worked with up to this point is u-substitution. And u-substitution really helps us solve a lot of things. But however, what it really does is it helps make a complicated-looking integral more simple. Um, something uh, that makes it look more like the familiar forms that I had listed at the top of page one. Um, as an example, I have here the... Uh, the definition of u substitution, but you've probably used up to this point, but I want to do one example to demonstrate what u substitution is and highlight what its importance is. So here I have the integral of x sine of x squared dx. In this case, what we tend to try to do is substitute something as u, try to identify what du is as a result, and try to make the integral more simple, something more familiar looking. In this case, what I do notice is that I have x squared here, and if I were to consider what the derivative of that is, the derivative of x squared would include just a singular x. And I do see that singular x outside of that uh, sine function. So that leads me to a pretty good setup for both u and du. I'm going to set u, in this case, as x squared, and then if I find what du is, I find that that is 2x dx, and solving for x dx, which I see right here, I see x dx, I can get x dx is the same thing as 1 half du, or du over 2, however you prefer to write it. That allows me to take this integral, this integral of x sine of x squared dx, and what I'm really going to do, if I write this in another color, what I'm going to do is replace this x dx that's inside of the integral. I'm going to replace that with 1 half du, and I'm going to simply replace x squared with u itself. So therefore, I will get 1 half, which I'll pull outside of the integral. 1 half x dx becomes just du, and I get sine of u du. 
Solving for this is very, very easy. The integral of sine is negative cosine, so we get negative one-half cosine of u plus c. And in this case, I usually say to check even if you need to replace with u back at the end. In this case, we do not have bounds on the integral, so we do need to replace u with what originally was defined as, which was x squared. So we should have negative one-half cosine of x squared plus c. So that should be the integral of x sine of x squared. Again, notice the, what u really did. It didn't change the integral at all. It's still the same integral. All it did was make it look prettier, look more manageable, more or less. That's what the u substitution method really does. However, there are quite a number of integrals that cannot be solved this way. U substitution is only so good. I'd say for the complicated in integrals, U substitution helps us solve roughly 30% of them. Um, then there's about another 20% that are special cases that we'll get into near the end of Chapter 7. Um, but the other 50%, I'd say, is solved with this new method that we're going to discuss in this section. That method being called integration by parts. Um, now, to get integration by parts, what we need to consider is the product rule for derivatives, something that you also define in Calc 1. The product rule is shown right here. It's a derivative of f times g, and you get one of the functions times the derivative of the other, plus the derivative of the other one times the original uh, second function. So say if I say f in green, then I'll have uh, f show up one time times the derivative of g, and then the derivative of f times just g by itself. That's what the product rule does. You take the derivative of, each of one of the functions, multiply by the original, then plus the derivative of the other function, multiply by the original. So that's what the product rule does. Well, in order to get the integration by parts method, all we do is really take an integral of both sides of this. What we're going to do is take an integral of that side and an integral of this side. What that more or less will do is cancel out the derivative that we do here. We end up just with the two functions by itself. And then we have an integral on the other side. In order to clean this up to make it look even nicer, what we're going to do is define f of x as u. So this is going to be u, this is going to be u, this would thus be u prime or du. And then we're going to define g as v. So g prime is going to be dv, and then g is just v by itself. We do that to make it a little bit cleaner, um, just, just because there's a lot of x's thrown around that really don't need to be there. It could be defined in x, y, t, doesn't matter. So we have that rewritten here with the derivative of uv equals u times dv plus v times du. If we take the integral of both sides, what we get or, uh, is just uv equals the integral of the uh, right side here. And then since we notice that there's a plus in the middle, we can split that into two integrals if we so please. Now, using this, so using the fact that we have uv equals to those two integrals, what we are going to do is simply solve for one of those integrals by subtracting the other one to the other side. That way we have a way of rewriting an integral. So I'm going to move the integral of vdu to the other side by simply subtracting it. And so what we get is the definition of integration by parts as shown right here. We have the integral of u times dv equals uv minus the integral of vdu. All right, so that is the de uh, definition of an integral. If you don't like writing u and v, I know myself, my u's and v's can look very similar. You can use any other two variables you want to. Maybe you like to use f and g, but you don't even need to use x for that. So you can just say integral of, u of f times dg equals f times g minus g times df, whatever you want to do. That works fine.
notice that this is different in essence that than what 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 u substitution was doing u substitution did nothing to change the integral all it did was change how it looks u sub substitution is akin to changing two fourths into one half doesn't change the overall value or really what the function is itself all changing is what it looks like in this case what we actually are doing is taking an integral this integral defined as u times dv, and we're changing that into a new integral. Specifically, we're changing that into an integral of v du that's being subtracted by the two functions multiplied. So this is actually changing the entire form. And that makes it a lot more malleable to work with. What we're actually going to do now is identify two pieces inside of an integral, one that would be kind of complicated to solve otherwise, and try to take the derivative of one of those to try to eliminate that or to change its appearance. We're going to have a lot of different examples of this. Um, again, there's a lot of ways of, of what how we're going to go about this, but the main one that you're going to want to think about is how you define u, because that's usually how you're going to work through a lot of these. Uh, u is going to be the one that, if you look at the original formula, what happens to u is that originally it was just the normal function of the integral, and then you take the derivative of it. Whereas when you're working with v, you have the derivative of v originally, and then you take the integral of that and put that into a new integral. So you're taking the antiderivative of that. Um, hopefully, when we take the derivative of u, our goal is that it more or less disappears, or at least it changes form enough that we can use it, or it meshes well with the rest of what's going on. Um, so, as I have written here, this last paragraph I think is really important. Um, often you will define u as part of the integral that becomes more simple if its derivative is taken, such as a singular x term that disappears when you take it as derivative. So when you take the derivative of x, it just becomes 1, or whatever coefficient is in front of it. So that would act as a really good value for u, so that when you change that into a new form of an integral, you no longer have that variable anymore. Hopefully it disappears. Um, or you can think of u as part of the integral that interacts better when it's taken as a derivative. For example, when you have natural log of x, the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. So, when you have that, you can take the derivative of natural log of x, set that as u, and then when it's in the new integral, it's going to turn into an algebraic function, which tends to be a lot easier to work with. We've been working with a lot of polynomials and algebraic functions up to this point. Now, this is better, is easier said than done, so let's show you some examples of this. And actually, I'd say it's easier done than said, weirdly enough. Um, now, if we look at this function, or this uh, question here, we have the integral of x cosine of x dx. Notice how similar this looks to the first problem we did, example 1. Example 1 above was integral of x sine of x squared dx. So the original, the one that we were working with before was integral of x sine of x squared dx. And it would have still been solvable if this was cosine instead of sine. Still would have been able to solve the same way. Now, all that's changing is that this is an x on the inside. But that means that this doesn't work well with u substitution. I can't set u as x squared anymore and du as 2x dx to hopefully eliminate this and the dx. That doesn't work with this case because I don't have that power. So in this case, one that looks a lot like it could be solved with u substitution, but the power is just a little bit off or there's an extra term hanging on, that usually means that integration by parts is a good method to try. So what we're going to do is, what we're first going to do is define two values as u and dv. And then we're going to evaluate what v and du are and then we'll set up the integral. So step one, find u, v, du, and dv. That's the first thing we're going to do. So in this case, uh, we have x cosine of x. Well, if, what we are going to start with, if you think about the original definition of integration by parts, is the integral of u dv equals uv minus v du. Well, if I take u, I'm going to try to take the derivative of it and try to reduce it down. 
If I set u as, say, the cosine x term here, then all that's going to happen is that I'm going to get du is sine of x dx, technically negative. But that means that I still have a trig function hanging around. Nothing happens to it. That's kind of unfortunate. But if I were to instead set u as the value of x, the other uh, term there, then when I take the derivative of that, all I get is dx. Therefore, the algebraic term will disappear in the next integral. Now, if I set the other value, the other, since I'm looking for two things to set as uh, one is u, one is dv, the other term must be dv, so dv must be the rest of this, cosine x dx. And so what I'm going to do is take the antiderivative of that, so I'm going to take the integral, more or less, of cosine, and if you do that, what you find is the integral of that is just sine of x. You can even check that sine, the derivative of sine is cosine x dx. That's our first step. Then we're going to set up the definition. So now we're going to take our integral term x cosine of x dx and remember what we did is that we set this this x part as u and we set cosine of x dx as dv so then when i try to match this up with the definition i'll even move this down a bit when i set this up with the definition where i'm looking for u times v and then I'm looking for the integral of v du. I can try to match that up correctly. Let's put those in the appropriate colors. So u du. Then in green, we have v and the integral of v. Okay. Well, u is the same value we had before. It's just x multiplied by v we found to be sine of x. So that's x sine x minus the integral of v du. v we found to be we found to be sine x. du was just dx. So that's what we have now. x times sine x, which is outside of an integral, nothing needs to be done to that, minus sine x dx. That's solvable. That's just the integral of sine. We have that defined on the previous page. We know how to solve that one. So we have if I write this up here, we have x sine x minus sine x dx. Again, x sine x is already outside of an integral, so nothing needs to be done to that. But when I take the integral of sine x, what I get is negative cosine x plus c. And we therefore, we get x sine x plus cosine of x plus c. Now technically if you want to be a stickler about it, there when you do the integral of sine x you get negative cosine x plus c with the parentheses outside of there, but when you distribute that negative to plus c, c is just a constant, so it could be a positive or a negative constant, it's arbitrary, so it doesn't really matter. However, that should be our definition. Okay, so that's how um, by parts goes. You find u, v, d, u, d, v, so you set those up separately, you set up the definition, and then three, you solve it, finish it off. So that's how we're going to work through most of these parts. Okay, um, yeah. So we have a few more examples to go through, and then I'm going to point out some pretty common things you tend to see with these. So I have another one, integral of x squared sine x dx. Well, we just dealt with one very similar to that. We just did integral of x cosine x. So this should be dealt in a very similar way. We know that if I were to try to take the derivative of sine x, it would continue to cycle between sines and cosines constantly. But if I start to take the derivative of x squared, it should start to reduce down. So what I'm going to do is set u as x squared 
and therefore du is 2x dx. dv is going to be sine x dx. And then when I take the integral of that, what I get is negative cosine of x. Therefore, we have this now set up as the integral of x squared sine x now equals u times v, which is negative x squared cosine of x. I'll move this up a little bit. Minus a negative cosine x times 2x. So plus the integral of 2x cosine x. And I'll actually pull that 2 outside of the integral. All right, well, that's good. However, again, we have another algebraic function x times the trigonometric function cosine. I can't do a u substitution and solve that down again. So what that means is that I actually have another round of this. I need to do another u uh, integration by part, setting up u and dv. So I'll say that these previous ones I said as u1 and v1 we can do this one more time. I could set u2 as the x term. And then the, the derivative of our second version of u is dx, just like we had in the previous question. dv, the second time, is now cosine of x. And now if I find the antiderivative of that, I get sine of x, which would be cosine x dx. So therefore, with these as my integration parts, I now have negative x squared cosine x is still outside there, plus 2. And now I split up this integral into our pieces, including dx. So that integral into our new pieces. We now have u times v, which is x sine x minus v times du. So minus the integral of sine x dx. Notice that the two coefficient that came out of the integral will now multiply all of these terms. So that's why I'm keeping those square brackets there. But now we should be able to solve this negative x squared cosine of x plus 2x sine x and then when I take the integral of negative sine, the integral of sine is negative cosine times that negative makes it positive again. So positive cosine x plus c. That would be our answer. Okay. So yeah, that, so that would be our answer for the integral of x squared sine x dx. So sometimes you can take multiple steps to get through an integration by parts. Now, some of you may be wondering at this point, because we haven't done any integrals that have bounds on them, um, some of you may be wondering what happens to these terms. So this negative x squared cosine x, this 2x sine x even, these terms that we technically didn't do an integral for. At the end, the only actual integral we did was this sine x. We took turn that into cosine x. Well, that doesn't matter. Um, all the terms that you have at the end are still going to have the bounds applied. So this was from a to b originally. Um, so instead of integral of x squared sine x, this was from a to b up here. Well, then I would take all of my terms here that I got at the end and I would take them from A to B. So all of it. So that's what would happen. And we're going to have an example of that right here. So we have the integral of from 1 to 2, t to the 6 times natural log of t. There should also be a dt there. Okay, so integral of one to, uh, from 1 to 2 of t to the 6, natural log of t dt. 
All right. Uh, now we see something different here. Uh, we see the t to the six and natural log of t dt. Now we saw what happened when we had increased um, terms of an algebraic function. So that t to the six like, is something similar to x squared that we had in the previous case. X squared, it took a couple tries, but eventually disappeared. Um, when we look at the other term we have though, natural log of t, if I tried to set that as dv, and said dv was natural log of t dt, we don't really have the integral of that. That's not something that we have yet anyway. Um, so we, we should not really set that as the integral. Natural log of t actually is going to be our value for u. And again, I'll, I'll go through uh, something that will help you identify what you should set up as u in a moment. u we're going to set up as natural log of t. The reason I do this is because the derivative of natural log of t is very useful. The derivative of natural log of t is 1 over t times dt. That's very useful because that's basically an algebraic function. That's otherwise known as t to the negative 1 if you want to. And that works really well in tandem with the other part of this integral, which is an algebraic function. If we do dt, or dv rather, as the rest of that function, so dv is equal to t to the 6 dt, if I take the integral of that, what we get is 1 over 7 t to the 7th power as an algebraic function. Nice and easy. So therefore, I would take this integral now uh, from 1 to 2 t to the 6 natural log of t dt. And now I'm going to rewrite this as our new integral um, or our new integration by parts. We have u and v. We have uh, 1 7th. I'll put the coefficient out first and then the algebraic t to the 7th times natural log of t minus v du. So these two terms. So minus, I'll pull the 1 7th out front, I think. So minus 1 7th from 1 to 2 of t to the 7th times 1 over t dt. Nice. This works out really handy. Now again, this algebraic term is going to be taken from 1 to 2, but we'll do that in a moment after everything is integrated. 1 over 7th, t to the 7th power, natural log of t. This is t to the 7th times 1 over t, which just becomes t to the 6th, because that's going to cancel one of those t's out. So we have 1 7th from 1 to 2, t to the 6th power, dt. That is just an algebraic function inside of an integral. That's super easy to do. We get 1 7th, t to the 7th power, natural log of t, minus, that's going to bring down another 7, times that 7 is 1 over 49, t to the 7th power. We would normally have a plus c, but in this case, we're simply going to take all of this, everything we have, we're going to take that from 1 to 2. All right. So we plug in 2, we get uh, 2 to the 7th. 2 to the 7th is 128, so 128, divided by 7, times natural log of 2, um, then minus 1 over 49, t to the 7th, which we already saw was 128, so minus another 128 over 7. Then we subtract away what happens when we plug in 1. Now, this isn't as good as because we don't have 0, but technically we kind of do. Because when you plug in 1 into natural log of t, you get an answer of 0. Natural log of 1 is 0. So minus 0. Minus 1 over 49 times 1 to the 7th is just 1 over 49. So we get a final answer of 128 over 7 natural log of 2. Minus, this is going to add another uh, 49 to it. And actually, this one should be a 49, not a 7. Apologies. 
So it's going to add another 49 to it, so that'll actually make it minus 127 over 49. So that's going to be our final answer. Maybe I'll do that in red. Uh, red. There we go. So that's going to be our final answer. 128 over 7, natural log of 2, minus 127 over 49. If you were to do that as a decimal, as a decimal approximation, uh, you get approximately 10.08. If you do that as a decimal approximation. Okay, so notice we still did the integration bounds to all parts of the integral that we found, even if it quote unquote came outside of the integral when applying the integration by parts method. Um, now, I've been saying that there is a way of trying to recognize what is good for you. Uh, and by you, I mean the letter U. Generally, you're trying to identify some part of the integral that reduces down really nicely when you take it as a derivative. There is a nice acronym that can help you with that, though. Uh, and that acronym is L-I-A-T-E, or LIATE, or LIATE, however you want to say it. Sometimes it's ILATE because sometimes these first two are going to be interchangeable. Uh, the, the first one, L, uh, this stands for logarithmic. So that means stuff like natural log of x, log of x squared, something like that. So that's what we're looking for first. Then, i is going to stand for inverse, there's already an i there, so it's going to stand for inverse trig. So this is stuff like arctan of x or sine to the negative 1 of x, however you like to write inverse trig. We would typically like to use that as well for u because when you take the derivative of arctan, that actually becomes an algebraic function technically. With a, Sometimes they have square roots if you're doing stuff with like sine inverse. And the same holds for natural log of x. When you do the derivative of natural log of x, you get 1 over x as we showed earlier. So these are really good functions to set as u because they change into a completely different form. They, they come away from the inverse trig or logarithmic form, which tends to be very hard to interact with other things. Uh, after that are algebraic functions, and I'd say that there's a pretty big space between those. Algebraic functions are anything like x squared or x cubed minus x squared plus 7, something like that. If you have that entire thing as an algebraic uh, expression multiplied by something, uh, then you maybe would set those as the value for u and take the derivative of that. Um, after that is trig, and the reason that trig follows algebraic is because, or in terms of the hierarchy, is because when you're working with sine, or you're working with cosine, any of these kind of functions, what tends to happen is that when you take the derivative of sine, you get cosine. When you take the derivative of cosine, you get negative sine. When you take the derivative of negative sine, you get negative cosine. It just keeps bouncing back and forth. It very often will not help to set u as sine or cosine because it's not eliminating the function itself. It still sticks around, it's just it's changing forms. There will be special cases of that, but most times no. However, the last thing that you will, you will often set as u is an exponential function. And I'm talking about stuff like a to the x, or more commonly, e to the x. The reason why we don't set these as u is because when you set u as e to the x, the derivative of u would thus be e to the x dx. Nothing happens to it. The function does not change at all even. It's still the same thing. So it, it seems pretty futile to, to set that as u. Again, there may be very special cases, but for the most part, you will not set the exponential as the value for u. Uh, note that this is just a rule of thumb. It's not necessarily concrete, and it's not going to be true for every single integral possible. There will still be some exploration that you need to do. It's just this, um, this acronym can help you uh, try to identify uh, what should be said as u or du, particularly when you have some things of an integral that you haven't seen before. 
So we have a few more integrals to do as examples of this, and hopefully we can apply the concepts of Laete, if, if, if we can. Uh, we have here the integral of x e the x. Well, if we try with Laete, or Laete, I think I like it, um, for what we set as u, I do not see any logarithmic, so I'm going to say no there. Um, I do not see any inverse trig function, so I'm going to say no there. The next thing I see is an algebraic function. I see x. x is an algebraic function. If it was x or even x squared plus 1, something like that, it would still be algebraic. So that's probably going to be the first thing I'm going to try to set as u, and we'll see what happens from there. So again, a lot of these can be ex exploratory. Set u as x, and then we set du, and we notice that x disappears. We had an example of that earlier. So far, that seems really good. Let's see what happens, though, when we set the rest of it as dv. So e to the x dx would be set as dv. When we take the integral of that, the integral of e to the x is e to the x. It's another integral form you should know. It's on page 1. So notice what happened here is that x disappeared, but e to the x did not. That's really good because the whole goal is to try to make a simpler integral to deal with. And so that's what we're going to get here. We're going to set this integral as u times v, which is x times e to the x, minus the integral of v du, which is e to the x is v, and du is just d to the x, or dx. That is an integral I can work with, because we already did that. That's the same thing as dv. So that's an actual integral that we can calculate. So we get x e to the x minus the integral of e to the x, which is itself e to the x plus c, because we do not have any bounds of integration. That's it. Nice and easy to solve. Notice that this one would have been impossible otherwise using something like u substitution. Can't just set u as x and then you just get the exact same integral. So not helpful. All right. Now, if you want, since this one did not take too much time, you can also go into this and check real quick to see if the derivative of this makes sense. So take the derivative of this and see if we get x e to the x back. Well, the derivative of, of x e to the x, so if I do derivative of x e to the x minus e to the x plus c, kind of just checking my work here, um, I get the derivative of x e to the x, that's going to be a product rule. So the derivative of the second one, e to the x, it doesn't really matter which one you do first. Uh, so I'll say that's going to be x e to the x plus the derivative of the other one, which is the derivative of x is 1, so plus e to the x. So that's the product rule from x e to the x. And then when I do the derivative of minus e to the x, I get minus e to the x. And then the derivative of a constant just disappears. So therefore, I see that e to the x and minus e to the x cancel. I just get x e to the x. I got back to what I started with. Technically dx there too, but whatever. All right. So showing that it does work back and forth, even though the resulting forms may look a little bit weird. A couple more here. Uh, integral of arc sine of y dy. All right, that looks kind of weird because that's not really two functions, or it doesn't seem like it's two functions multiplied. Um, however, that, that is really going to narrow down how we evaluate this because we're going to try to set up what u is, find the derivative of that, and then also find dv and find the integral of that. Well, I, I if I can't do this integral, then it does not make sense to do this, to set arc sine of y as dv, because then I would have to find the integral of that to find v. So it does not even make sense to even try that. Um, that means that the only function that I have there, arc sine of y, is going to be our value for u. And then we need to uh, define the derivative of arc sine of y. Now, arc sine of y is a derivative that you most likely have done before. So it is one that uh, we should have in our banks, I guess, of knowledge. 
we have that the derivative of arc sine of x is 1 over the square root of 1 minus y squared dy. That's the derivative of arc sine of y. I'll center this up a little bit more. So du is equal to that. All right. Now, then what the heck do I set as dv? Funnily enough, dv is just going to be dy. That's all that's left. Technically, one dy if you want to think about it, but just dy itself. Well, when I take the integral of that, the integral of dy is just y. So that's what we get as v. As v. I may be wondering, okay, well, where's this going? Let, let, let's see what happens. Again, this is exploratory typically in nature. You're not necessarily going to know immediately if your values for u and v work. You're going to have to test some things out, see what happens. Uh, in this case, u and v multiplied. I'll put the algebraic first. So y times arc sine of y minus the integral of v du. So y times that uh, 1 over square root. So I'll put the y on top divided by the square root of 1 minus y squared dy. Okay, well, that might not be immediately solvable, at least to the naked eye, but we do notice I have a phrase of 1 minus y squared. Which, so I have a y to the second power, and I have a y to the single power on top. That means I should hopefully be able to solve this using u substitution. Uh, since I already used u, we can use any other variable. It's still just the method of substitution, so you can find any variable you want. I'll say w. So I'll say w is going to be 1 minus y squared. And then when I take the derivative of that, that's going to be negative 2y dy. Now I don't have negative 2y. I do have negative y though. There is that negative out front. So I'll just move the 2 over to get 1 half dw equals negative y dy. So therefore I can replace this y arc sine of y. I don't need to mess with the stuff outside the integral already. Uh, now this integral is a plus because I took out the minus from this. So I have plus um, dw or plus one half dw, sorry, one half the integral of dw over the square root of w. Or you could think about this, y arc sine of y plus one half. You could think about one over w, w is the same as w to the one half. So this is w to the negative one half dw because it's on the bottom of the fraction. So that will allow us to solve this y arc sine of y plus if we take the derivative of this we increase this by 1 so that becomes w to the 1 half and then we're going to do 1 over let's write this better so I'll have the w to the 1 half and then I'm also going to have 1 over my new uh, exponent of 1 half. 1 over 1 half is the same thing as 2 plus c. However, I see that that and that will cancel out. So I should just have y arc sine of y plus w to the 1 half, which w is defined as 1 minus y squared. So I'll say the square root of 1 minus y squared plus c. So that would be our answer. All right. Again, you would not know initially at the beginning of the problem that this is going to happen, that you're going to have an integral that ends up being solvable using u substitution. Don't have the misconception that we know that going into it. Um, just know that we're trying to, we're, it's usually that you're like flying by the seat of your pants. You can have an idea of what to do and you can test with it, um, but you very often will not have that foresight of knowing exactly where it's going to go unless you've done that problem before. So 
um, don't feel bad if you do a problem, you explore something, and the initial solution you come up with doesn't work. It's it's very often going to be that case. All right. Last example I have here. And I'll say that this is a personal favorite of mine, actually. Um, and the reason is because this one is a little bit special. It's going to solve in a very, very special way. It, it won't solve like a lot of the previous ones will. So let's make sure I have enough room for this. There we go. All right, so we're going to find the integral of e to the x times sine of x. Now, the reason I like this, you'll, you'll see in a moment, um, is also because uh, that's it goes against the Liate thing. It's, it's going to show an example where Liate, the, the way that we tried to define what we should use as the value for u, this is actually not going to be true in this case. Because Liate would tell us, okay, use the trig function sine x as u first and try that out. However, what we're actually going to do, we're going to set u as uh, the exponent. However, theoretically, you should be able to uh, solve that either way. But I want to show you this special case, because this is also a fun problem. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to set u equal to e to the x. Weird, I know. du is equal to e to the x dx. Doesn't seem initially helpful. However, the other function that I have there, sine of x dx, is in itself very helpful. Um, because it also, like u, e to the x, doesn't disappear when you take the derivative or the integral. It just changes forms. In this case, if you take the integral of sine x, you get negative cosine. So now we have, if I keep a running tally over here, uh, we have the integral of e to the x sine x dx. So far, we now have that as the integral, or as u times v, which is minus e to the x cosine x plus the integral, because plus because this negative cosine, plus the integral e to the x cosine x dx. All right, well, that seems kind of unfortunate because we still have that integral of an expo exponential times a sine or a trig function. So that means we can try to do this again and see what happens. So I'm going to set that as my first iteration. Second iteration. We're going to set my second iteration also as e to the x and second iteration as e to the x dx. So no change there. In this case, d, dv2 now is not going to be cosine x, it's just going to be, or not going to be sine x, it's going to be cosine x dx. And therefore, v2 is going to be sine of x. So now, I can rewrite this. We have negative e to the x cosine x plus, I'm going to replace this integral with the quantity e to the x sine x, and then I am going to have a minus, minus the integral of e to the x sine x dx. All right, now, now you may be noticing that, yeah, this is going to get cyclical and I can keep doing this. I don't need to, though. This was the last step that I need to do to solve this. And the reason is because this solution I have here is what happens when I broke down the integral of e to the x sine of x dx. If you notice, e to the x sine x dx, this integral here, shows up on this side as well. It's the same exact integral. Therefore, what I can do to make, make it so I don't have an integral on this side anymore is simply add that integral, e to the x sine x dx, to both sides. That will eliminate the integral from this uh, right side here. And when I add the two integrals of the same thing on this side, I could just say that's 2 times the integral e to the x sine x dx equals, if I put this in a better order, I could say e to the x times sine x minus cosine x.
And also, there's a plus C there, technically. All right. Well, lastly, solve that integral. Let's get rid of that 2. So divide by 2 on both sides. We get the integral of e to the x sine x dx, which is what we're trying to solve for. We find on the other side no more integrals, so we technically solved it. We have 1 half e to the x times sine x minus cosine x. Again, I just factored out uh, e to the x out of both these terms up here. And then when I take c divided by 2, c was just an arbitrary constant, so that constant divided by 2 is itself just another constant, so I'll keep it as c. You could change it to k if you want to, is usually what people use for an altered constant, but it doesn't matter. That is our end solution. Hopefully you see why I really like this problem. It's very, very unique because it doesn't follow the standard trig form or the standard integral form of solve an integral directly change it into something else and you're done in this case we actually couldn't really solve for the integral what we had to do was keep a cyclical nature until that integral showed up again and then move the original integral back to the other side so we could have a phrase that shows what the solution of the integral is so kind of a weird way of doing that and there are a couple other integrals like this that can follow a cyclical manner so keep an eye out for that if you see that both terms are pretty cyclical like the trig or exponential functions it may have something like this where you need to keep going until you get the original form back again and then solve for that all right, with that said, that's everything I wanted to go through in this lecture for section 7.1. If you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments below or ask your instructor directly. But with that said, I hope you have a nice day.